Let's move on into a little bit about some of the uh, refrigerant management and the EPA. Section 608. Are y'all familiar with Section 608, EPA? Hopefully you will be if you're not already. That's dealing with your refrigerant uh, certification. Now, there's three types of certifications, actually four types. Type one deals with small appliances. This is uh, on uh, 422. Type two deals with high pressure applications. That's five pounds and over on the amount of refrigerant system. And type three uh, deals with low pressure applications. By the way, type two also includes very high pressure applications. Well, what's the difference between a high pressure and a very high pressure? Okay. It has to do with the boiling point of the refrigerant. Okay. And um, I know we don't deal with it every day, but there are some refrigerants that will come in a bottle very similar to an oxy or acetylene bottle. And they're under much higher pressures than what your R22 or R12 or, or standard refrigerants that you're probably going to be more familiar with through the time. Okay. In order to get your EPA license, you have to pass the core. The core is the part that deals with the impact that the R uh, uh, CFCs, HCFCs have on the environment. It, it, it goes into about the chlorine molecule, uh, how bad it is on the, the uh, ozone, how things are affected with it. And it's a win-win ratio for the chlorine against the ozone molecule. It's about like one to uh, one chlorine molecule can destroy 100,000 uh, ozone molecules. Who, 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 who's going to win? <laughs> One to a hundred thousand. Who's going to win? And that has to, uh, the, you know, what what happens when we lose the ozone is we see increases in skin cancer. We've seen decreases in marine life and many other factors. I'm not going to go all into them right now, but uh, many other factors. But keep in mind, we don't need to be releasing refrigerant into the atmosphere. Number one, we can reuse the same refrigerant. We can clean it up. Don't be wasteful. That's what it comes down to. Many, many companies were doing this long before the EPA said do it. And uh, you find out that, that those companies didn't have to do a whole lot of changes when the EPA come in and says, this is what's going to happen. It's been out there for a while now. When was, uh, Ricky, you remember when the certification was required? Was it, uh, 92? 91, 92, somewhere around in there. And, and it's always surprised me that that question may still be on the EPA test, some of the EPA test. It may ask you, when do you have to have your certification? Like it's in the future. It's not in the future. It's now. Okay. Uh, when studying for it, do this though. If you see dates or measurements of any kind, make a key note in your mind on that. Remember that one because it's probably going to be on the test. Okay. What happens if you pass the core, type 2, type 1, and type 3? What are you going to get? Universal. Universal. <laughs> That's the answer. Universal. Universal is what you need to shoot for. Okay. Not everybody has to have type 3. There's no question about it. But you will probably need type 1 and, and 2. And, and it, at least type 1 and 2. I don't know too many people that deal with just appliances. Some do. But usually appliances and home air conditionings usually go together. Okay. And if that's the case, you're going to need both types one and two. All right. And the reason being because how many home systems nowadays would have under five pounds of, 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 
of refrigerant. Very few. Very few. Okay. The three R's. Recover, recycle, and reclaim. Well, in order to recover refrigerant, we would have to remove the refrigerant from the system. Well, how would we do that? <clears throat> now, vacuum pump comes for evacuation. Okay. What we're going to have to have is something similar to one of these three that I have. One. Here's another. And here's another. Y'all notice anything? They all look similar. <laughs> they do. <laughs> Two of them got instructions with them. One of them, I don't know what the instructions is that. <laughs> but I guarantee you this. Every one of these units is going to operate a little bit different. So, how can I tell you how to use one of these? I can't. You're going to have to become familiar with the one that you're going to be using. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> that's that's not really <laughs> What's that mean? Well, we, no, come on, tell the truth. What we do, we pick it up after we can't figure it out, right? Okay. But, no, but you will have to have a recovery unit. Well, where are you going to put the refrigerator? Well, how about a recovery drum? Notice the colors on the recovery drum. What's kind of odd about that one? You notice it? Yeah, but there's also something that's kind of odd about the colors on it. They got the yellow top. Uh, should be gray with the yellow top. Okay, but it does have two valves. One that, when you open it, you would get liquid. The other would be vapor. And how they do that, they do that with what we call a dip tube. A dip tube, you would look at the tank, and again, y'all know how good my art is, it's not. So there's a tank, and I know that looks more like a beaker, but that's a tank. And uh, the dip tube would come down at the bottom, you'd have two valves, one here, one there. Dip tube's just coming down to the bottom. That way you can pull the liquid off the bottom. There are some refrigerants, and we'll go into this in another lesson, but there are some refrigerants that have to be charged as a liquid in order to get the full blend of the refrigerants. Okay, but that's not the purpose of, of the recovery tank. The recovery tank right now, we, or we're looking at storage for that refrigerant when we recover. Well, what if we take that refrigerant and we put it back in the system after we Repair. What have we done? We recycled it, right? Okay. We can do that in the field. We can actually do a little clean up while we have the refrigerant out, out of the system. How do you do that? Run it through some filters. Not a big deal. Uh, sometimes you may actually have a little air in the system. You can actually recover that air out of the system or, or get that air out of the system. Uh, by using the vapor uh, port on the, the uh, tank. How would you know that you had air in the system? Okay, the pressures would not respond with the temperature pressure chart correctly. They would read, the pressure would read high. If you have air in that tank, then that's, that's what you would do is bring it down until it does or bleed the air off the top. Refrigerant's heavier than air, Right? So the air is going to be on the top of the tank. Perfectly legal, y'all. I know that probably sounds like, hey, you said you can't release refrigerant. Well, you're not releasing refrigerant. What are you releasing? Air. Okay. All right. 
Now, why can't we use, and I don't know what I did with it, did I even bring it in here? Why can't we use a regular refrigerant cylinder? Can't refill it. Some pretty hefty fines associated with that. And if you look at the the way the cylinder is made, let's bring it back up here again. This is much heavier, much heavier material. It also has some dates on it, retest dates. It also has your tear weight. A lot of information right here in these, in fact, you'll be going through this in one of your labs in the very near future. In fact, that's C1 lab. We'll take you through some of this. DOT. Anybody know what DOT stands for? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other ones that, that uh, what do you call it, administer the rules and regulations for the refrigerant tanks. Okay. And again, like I said, there's some pretty hefty fines that go along with misuse of these. Y'all remember the old air tank that people would make out of some of the uh, used refrigerant tanks? Mm -hmm. That's a no-no. Don't do that. Very thin steel on those things. Very thin and you take a chance of uh, rupture. Okay, let's hit a few of the other things about some of the re oh, by the way, who has to have the recovery unit? Um, Company. Does it have to be one on every service truck? No. No. It's nice to have it on every service truck <laughs> instead of having to run back to the shop and get it, but only one recovery unit is required for the company. But that's not usually the way they operate, but... but it's they, practical to have one on every truck until you have like... The I think so, <laughs> especially at the price of gasoline. You're right. <laughs> yeah, or even diesel. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what kind of vehicle you got, but... Uh, and, and just the... the, uh, the, the comfort of having it there, so to speak, you know. David, you might mention that uh, actually uh, the EPA requires that a company register their recovery machine with them. There's a form they're supposed to fill out and send in. That, that I don't know true. how many companies do that. That's, but it's... Well, <laughs> I can tell you that when I was working with UGA full-time, we had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got audited. So that's uh, something that 